Ephesians 3, 14 to 21 is Paul's second prayer to the Ephesians. Um, he's already brought it there right at the beginning, then verse 15 of chapter 1. 15 to 22 is his first prayer. This is his second prayer. And uh, we tremendously enjoyed going through that first prayer, and I'll mention it as we go through together. His prayer, of course, there was... Um, Really, I suppose that the Ephesians might know, might know God more intimately. They might know something of the hope of their calling, something of the riches of the glory, and something of the inheritance that the Ephesians enjoy as they come together as a church. And not least there in those verses in chapter 1, uh, 15 to 20 odd, uh, he shows something of the surpassing greatness uh, of his power towards uh, the believers there at Ephesus. And his whole purpose in that prayer is to build them up and to encourage them and to uh, show them that they are a very special people, as indeed we know that we are uh, in Christ. And the theme of the, and the purpose of this second prayer here in uh, chapter 3, 14 to 21, particularly, and then verses 20. Uh, to, uh, 22 as well, um, is that we might know something of God's power, something of God's greatness, something that we might know what it is to access all that God has made available to us. Uh, God has laid out a tremendous plan for his church and as individuals, and he wants us to know and enjoy and experience and bring that all into our lives that we might know what it is to live purposefully for lives. It was Bishop Mole who said, who has not read and reread the closing verses of the third chapter of Ephesians without the feeling of being permitted to throw parted curtains to see the holiest place in the Christian life? The blessing that's ours to be a believer is wonderfully laid out for us here uh, in this second prayer of Paul to the Ephesians. But he starts off there, of course, uh, in verse 14. And he says, for this reason. And you notice, of course, that he started his first prayer with the same words, for this reason. For this reason, he says. Resuming the train of thought uh, that he left there in that first prayer. What was it in his mind when he said, for this reason? Well, what was in his mind was, the basis of his prayer was the knowledge in the, of God's purpose and plan for their lives. That they might have a greater knowledge of God's working and dealing with them as believers. And it is because of what God has done in Christ and revealed to Paul that he wanted to bring to the Ephesian believers here now. He wants them to understand what it is they've inherited. He wants them to understand what the wonder is of being a believer. Not just in this time, but particularly in our times as well. And he's praying, of course, that God will reveal his will to them as he reveals God's greatness and power. And uh, that's why uh, so often we say, don't we, the Bible and prayer often go together. It's as we read God's revealed will that we know what it is to pray in response to that. And uh, I know some people do it in different ways. I know some people go to prayer first and then read the word. But I, yes, you pray that God might illuminate the word and bring a knowledge of his will. But it's out of that reading and out of that understanding that we then come to prayer. And that's the way that Paul does it time and time again throughout his letters. Know what the will of God is for your life and what he's doing in your life. And then come to him in prayer, in thanksgiving and of course in petition as well. And then Paul goes on, notice what he says here, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. That's an interesting expression. For the normal posture of the Jews, of course, was standing. 
Kneeling, we often read in the New Testament, is indicated a, a degree of earnestness. When Jesus fell on his face to the ground in the Garden of Gethsemane, he fell down. Stephen faced martyrdom, he kneeled. Now, God nowhere tells us how to pray. He doesn't say you have to stand, he doesn't say you have to kneel. You could be standing, you could be sitting, you could be walking, you could be on your bed. The important thing is, of course, is the attitude. Is the attitude. The intensity, the contact, the purpose, that's the attitude we should have. It's not so much the posture as the attitude. Now, I know some people feel uh, that, um, you know, they, they have to kneel, and a lot of people kneel before their bed on the night. That's fine. A lot of people feel that they have to, in some ways, um, prostrate themselves on the floor. Fine. For me, I'm quite content to sit and talk to God. It's all to do with our attitude, isn't it? Paul says, I kneel before the Father. In other words, I come with the right attitude towards God. I come in an acknowledgement of who God is, who it is that I'm coming before, and the great privilege that it is to come before our Heavenly Father. In other words, we don't go rushing into his presence. We don't go flippant and haphazard coming before him. There's that sense of reverence. And whatever helps you feel that sense of reverence, whether you sit or kneel or whatever, that's, of course, your individual choice. But it's all to do with that reverence, how we come before him. And recognizing again and again but I don't think it's a good thing to go rushing in. Oh, there's Arab prayers. I use Arab prayers all the time. I don't know about you. I talk to God as I'm walking. I talk to God as I'm, maybe he's in the car or so whatever. But it's a recognition of who it is we come before. We come before a holy God. And so we come with that reverence. Even if it's an arrow prayer, we come in the knowledge that we're speaking to a holy God. I kneel, says Paul, because I want to just really come with real earnestness to God on your behalf. And then, of course, this heavenly prayer that Paul brings, it's all that they might know and that we might know some of the glory of the riches of God and of Christ. And in verses 16 to 19, he sets out this wonderful picture of the greatness and glory of Christ. Now, it seems to me, I've picked four key words that will help us to understand what he's bringing to us in these verses. Four key words that will help us in this prayer. They are strength, love, knowledge, and fullness. Strength, love, knowledge, and fullness. He prays first that we might be strengthened by the indwelling Christ, by his Spirit. We might be strengthened, fortified. Secondly, we might be rooted and established in love, in the love of Christ and love for one another. And thirdly, that we might understand and grasp how great the love of Christ is. And fourthly, that we might be filled to the measure of the fullness that God wants to bring upon us. That really is the basis of his prayer. So it is well for us to go through and see what all these things mean. Verses 16, he says this, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your remain, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that we might be strengthened with power, says Paul. Now these two petitions, of course, that we might be strengthened through power and that Christ might dwell in our hearts go together. Both refer to the inner being, of course. On the inner being, one hand and the heart on the other. 
To have Christ is the same as, of course we know this, don't we? To have Christ is the same as having his spirit in us. Every Christian, when he comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. There's no second zapping or anything like that. We filled and we indwelt by the Spirit of God when we come to Christ in faith. And what Paul is praying here is for a deepening relationship. It's one thing to know that we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, says Paul, but it's another thing to go on having a deepening relationship with him. So that it is rooted and established. Rooted, he pictures maybe as a tree with tremendous roots. Remember a great oak, its roots go down and down and it's strong and some of these winds wouldn't blow it over. Not much of a root and it's gone. Paul says, I want you to be rooted. Rooted. Strengthened. So that the Spirit might reinforce our faith. The Spirit might reinforce our understanding of God's will. The Spirit might reinforce our understanding how we should live for Christ day by day that he might reinforce our trust and our faith when things are difficult, when things are hard, when we go through trying experiences. We are rooted. So in other words, we won't be blown away by the things of this world or the happenings that come upon us, illness, problems, difficulties. We are rooted, he says. You need to be rooted in Christ by his spirit so that you can face all the trials and difficulties of the world. Over the years, I've nearly said 60 years I've been here, but it gives me age away a bit, I don't know. Did I come when I was about 20, 40? <laughs> no. Anyway, over the years, I've seen many come to faith in Christ. Six months, two years, gone. No roots. No roots. And as we go on in our Christian life and in our Christian faith, we need to continually know what it is to be more and more rooted in the will of God and in Christ and in his faith, our faith for him. Paul is praying that they might be rooted, that the Holy Spirit might have an effect upon their lives and their living day by day. Particularly in the times that they live in here, tremendous persecution. We know little of it. Eunice and others know Tremendous persecution. But because they're rooted in Christ, he got through. That's the same with us. If we're rooted in Christ, the winds of the world and troubles won't buffet us. We will stand. And Christ, by his Spirit, will enable the Spirit, of course, to show us more of his love. It was uh, Spurgeon who said, Christ from his throne will both control and strengthen you with power by his spirit. So if Spurgeon says it must be true. But isn't it right? Christ from his throne will both control and strengthen you with power by his spirit. That's what Paul's praying for here. But not only strengthened and rooted and established by strength, of course, by the Spirit, but there's 17b. And I pray that being rooted and established in love as well. Yes, we need to know the power of the Spirit at work within us so that we can stand and develop and grow. But he says, you also need to be established in love. Why does Paul pray that Christ would control and strengthen the believers so that he might demonstrate his likeness in sacrificial love? As part of the family of God, we are encouraged, in fact commanded time and time again in the scriptures to love one another. And sometimes we need the strength of the Spirit to do that. 
because we come across people who are hard to love. Something about them, or they do something, or you upset them. Because sometimes we can be easily upset, can't we? We can easily go off the fly off the handle. And, but we need to know what it is to demonstrate love. One of the great attributes of the Christian is love, isn't it? And what did they say about the early church? My, how they love one another. And if we want to demonstrate something of the power of Christ on this estate, we need for them to say, my, how they love one another there. And that love is shown not just in our praying for one another, but our practical help and support to one another as well. We need the strength and power of the Spirit, says Paul, to demonstrate the love of Christ. The love of Christ. And of course, we all come from different experiences. We all come from different backgrounds. But we all come the same way. If we're a Christian this morning, we've come through Christ. We didn't bring any of our intellect or any of our uh, possessions or any of our things that we have achieved in life. We come as a poor, wretched sinner. And we've come to Christ, acknowledging our sin and accepting his forgiveness and experiencing that I've been reborn again. And none of us brought anything to that table. It's all of Christ. So we're all on an equal plane when it comes to Christ. When we come to faith in Christ, we come as every single one of us as a wretched poor sinner. And Paul says that is how we love one another. Through no superiority, no sense of grandeur or anything like that. We all come as wretched sinners. And experience the love of Christ that we might in turn show that love to one another and to the world as well. Yes, rooted and built up, strengthened by the Spirit and of course by the same token that Christ might display that he is there within our hearts by our life and living. We're sure that we believe in Christ by showing Christ through our lives, through our words, through our speeches. Our lives rooted and strengthened and rooted in love. But then, verse 18, he says this. We need to grasp something of the love of Christ. If we know what it is to be rooted and grounded and strengthened in love, Christ's love, we need to know what it is. Look at verse 18 may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know his love that surpasses knowledge. You want an example of love? There it is, verses 18 and the first part of verse 19. Paul passes now from the love which we experience and show by being rooted by the Spirit he prays again that we might know and comprehend what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of Christ's love. It's immeasurable, he says. It's immeasurable. The breadth of it. What's the breadth of Christ's love? That he cast our sins as far away as the east is from the west. That's the depth of his love. He took our sins and he cast them away. That's how much he loved us and loves us. Who else could do that? And he prays that we know again something of the same power to understand and appropriate all the dimensions of Christ's love for us that he saved us and cast our sins away. The length of it. It's a love that he loves 
which is an eternal love. He doesn't just love us because we come to him in faith. He loves us today, he loves us tomorrow, and he's going to love us for eternity. That's the love of Christ. We can fall in and out of love with one another. One day if somebody's upset us, we don't love them anymore. Christ never ceases to love us. That's the length of his love. It's, it's everlasting. It'll never end. Christ will never stop loving us. Even though we upset him. Even though we fail. Even though we let him down. Even if sometimes we turn away from him. He will never stop loving us. That's the length, he says. And the height. His love is going to take us all the way to heaven. That's the height. That's how much he loves us. He's going to take us to heaven to enjoy him forever. And the depth of his love, how was that shown? Well, that he left heaven, he became a man, he dwelt amongst us, he died on a cross, he went through death. That's a love, isn't it? He loves us that much, says Paul. Do we fully understand, says Paul, can we grasp how much Christ loves us? Can we truly understand and comprehend the dimensions? Paul says it surpasses knowledge. When we sit down and think about it, that's amazing, isn't it? Christ's love is unknowable as his riches are inexhaustible. What did Paul say there in chapter 3, verse 8? Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. His boundless love. That's what we're to make known in the world. The boundless riches of the love of Christ. That he died for you, for them, for me. Grasp that, says Paul. And you'll be more and more rooted. And then, what else you say there in verse 19? That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That, that we might be filled to a measure. Fullness is a characteristic word of Ephesians. We get the, we, time and time again he speaks of fullness, as Paul. But in Paul's fourth petition here, he prays that they may be filled with the fullness of God. Uh, and this aspiration is the same principle implied. You remember the command to be holy as God is holy? That's what he wants for us. That we might be so built and established and strengthened and rooted in love that we might become more and more holy as God is holy. That we might live holy lives. And surely, the Paul, what Paul is praying for here for the Ephesians is something that we need to understand and take on board, isn't it? Such a prayer, says Paul, is not only for this life, but that will take us to eternity. And uh, in saying this, of course, Paul's last petition points us to a heavenly perfection, doesn't he? We have no excuse to the challenge set before us whilst on earth. Because we are strengthened, we're empowered by the Spirit, we're dwelt by the love of Christ, we have been transformed by the Holy Spirit daily from one degree of glory to another until we reach perfection in heaven. That's the goal. That's the plan, that's the purpose of God for us. So as we look at these verses, we see Paul is praying for his readers that will be given strength of the Spirit, the ruling presence of love, Christ's love. They're bold petitions, aren't they, when you think about it? Very, very bold petitions. I wonder what the Ephesians thought as they read that. Wow. Wow. But then, 
verses 20 and 21. It brings it all to a conclusion. Now to him is able to imme- do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul's four petitions, of course, that we've spoke of there. A sandwich between verses 14 to 16 and 20 and 21. In other words, he's saying that God will answer our prayers because we are strengthened, we're encouraged, we're rooted. We go on to know more and more of the love of Christ. And God's ability to answer prayer is forcibly stated. I've got five stages here that will help us understand. God will answer our prayers more because we are rooted, we're established, we know the love of Christ, we know what it is to show the love of Christ. And as we can come with boldness before him, he says to the believers here, Because of this, you can come before the throne with great boldness. And God will answer your prayer because he's able to. That's a simple answer, says Paul, because he's able to. He's able to do immeasurably more. He is able, says Paul. There's nothing impossible for God. And God is neither idle or inactive. He never switches off. It happened to be last night. Sir Shield said, you never answered. What you, what, what? I asked you a question, you never answered. <laughs> you know what it is? You switch off, don't you? I switch off far too many times, I think, as far as she is concerned. No, she said, you, you're not listening. I was busy doing something. God's never like that. He's never too busy. As soon as we pray, he hears. And he's able to answer because he's always there. And he's able to do what we ask because he answers prayer. Not always as we want it, but he will always answer. And he's able to do what we ask and more than we imagine because he knows even our thoughts. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It's a frightening thing, mind you, isn't it? What would it be like if every time we sat in a congregation, everybody in the congregation knew exactly what you were thinking? That's a frightening thought, isn't it? What are you thinking? God knows. I don't know. God knows. That's a wonderful thing that he's so interested in us, but it's a fearful thing, isn't it? Because there are times he must upset him tremendously. Things he doesn't want to hear, but he has to. Because he's attentive to us at all times. And he's able to do all we ask because he can do and perform anything. Nothing is impossible for God. If it's according to his will. Nothing is impossible to God. And he's able to do more than we could expect or imagine. That's the God whom we come before. Paul says now to him, God, who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Do you notice that? According to the power that is at work within us. If we're indwelt by the Spirit of God, we're rooted and grounded, we know something of the fullness of the love of Christ, God is there. Attentive, listening, looking out for, answering, going ahead of us. And it was again C.H. Spurgeon who said this. What can we do without prayer? Prayer links us to the omnipotence of God. Like a lightning rod that pierces the clouds and brings down a mighty, mysterious power from on high. God will bless Elijah and send rain on Israel, 
But he married, you must pray for it. If the chosen nation is to prosper, chosen nation is to prosper, Samuel must pray for it. If the Jews are to be delivered, Daniel must pray for it. God will bless Paul and all the nations we converted through him, but Paul must pray for it. Paul prayed without ceasing. His epistle shows that he expected nothing except by asking. God will only answer our prayers if we bring them. It's as simple as that. In answer to Elijah, in answer to Samuel, in answer to Daniel, in answer to Paul, because they prayed. Don't give up on prayer. Whether it be your daily prayer or your hour prayers, don't give up. Because God will answer your prayers. And that, says Paul to the Ephesians here, is the whole life of the Christian. To live in the knowledge of God's presence by his spirit, to root and, us, root and establish us and strengthen us. We might experience more and more the love of Christ and work that out in our lives and living as we come to know him as a God who hears and answers prayer. You know, this, Paul is saying here, there's quite simply no limits to what God can do. The infinite ability of God to work beyond our prayers, our thoughts, and even our dreams, and work with power within us, of course, is not inhibited by God, it's by us. Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith, the Holy Spirit working, strengthening us, brings us something of a knowledge of the power that's available to us. And the privilege is available to us to come before God in prayer. And then finally, isn't it lovely when the preacher says finally? That's the time we usually go like that. Paul's prayer here relates to the fulfillment of his God's, God's really is his desire to have a, a society of love at the church. And what Paul is saying here, that God really wants the members of his church not only to be strengthened and to love and to know the love of Christ, but we need to take on board time and time again the greatness of God. That's the great God we have. For he's done for us, what he is doing for us, and what he will do for us. God's power has no limit. And he says he's able to do abundantly more than we even ask or imagine. There's no limit. The only limit, of course, is in our prayers. And again, it was C.H. Spurgeon who said this, the power to live in godliness is available as we yield ourselves for his will to be done through us. It is only limited by ourselves and our refusal to trust him. Let me make a final comment then about this power of God. The power of God is most clearly seen. How? Where's the power of God most demonstrated? In changed lives. Changed lives. When we come to faith in Christ, our lives are changed. As we go on in our faith, indwelt by the Spirit of God and the love of Christ, our lives are changed. We're transformed daily, on and on and on. And the power of God is most demonstrated in our lives. We show it by our life and living. In the Acts of the Apostles, of course, they waited for the power of God to come down, didn't they? They waited, send the power down. And he did. The Holy Spirit came down. Thousands of didn't know. And even Gentiles were included in the body of Christ. 
Paul went on to say in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power within. It's not how clever with words we are. It's not how much we can articulate. It's a demonstration of the presence of the power of God within us by his Spirit through the love of Christ. Glenn Scrivener, some of us might have read uh, his books. He says this, Christ is the storehouse of the Father's overflowing bounty. We are beggars, more than destitute in our sins. Yet, through Christ, we've been adopted as heirs into a royal family. We call Abba, Father, who is mind-blowingly rich and who literally loves us to death. Does that change the way that we approach God? Maybe our earthly father, maybe we think about our earthly fathers who had short arms and deep pockets. That's an old expression. Our heavenly father is different. In Jesus we come to a father who is both super wealthy and overflowingly loving and kind. So rejoice in the generosity of God and preach to the world by your life and living the unsearchable riches of Christ. And then how else could we finish with that wonderful doxology verse 21. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Paul says all the glory must be given to God. God, by the resurrection power who alone can transform our lives to his praise and glory, says Scrivener. He brings us life, he brings us power, he brings us love. And we must give the glory to him, not to anything of ourselves. <clears throat> I think when Ephesians read that, they must have thought, wow. I could imagine if I was there in that congregation, I would say, wow. Let me just take away and digest that. <laughs> Let me have a copy of that letter. Because that's what we need to do. We need to hear, we need to listen, we need to digest, and let it know, let it affect our lives and our living for him day by day.